So my hope would be nobody's even having to watch this video because you do the you've, you've done the practice test without watching the video and you did it perfectly. Don't expect anyone to watch the entire practice test for any chapter. I've got answers and solutions written up. You know, if there's things that you didn't get, jump to the portion of the video for the problems that you didn't get, but don't watch every second of this. Um, that's not really what this is designed for. So let me just jump into this. Uh, the first four problems are from the last section because I didn't want the word problems to get hidden. They're worth a chunk of points on the test, probably 20 points, maybe a little bit more, and just they're not particularly hard. So problem one starts off, it's a three-step problem. The first sentence basically tells me I'm going to have to create a fraction with a K in the numerator because I can replace the words varies inversely as with M is some number divided by So the varies inversely as can be replaced with some number divided by, and in this case, the square root of n. So I'm going to create an equation, kind of my step one of three. I'm going to write m for the variable that leads off the sentence equals for the is sign. And then inversely are the words some number divided by. What we did for those is we formed a fraction with a K in the numerator. And in the denominator of that fraction, I'm going to put symbols that represent the square root of N, which is just N under a square root symbol. Done with the first sentence. Don't need to look at it again. I move on to my second sentence in my second step, which is to take the numbers in the second sentence, plug them into the variables and solve for K, in this case by cross multiplying. So I'm going to plug, when m is 4, plug 4 in for m, n is the square root of 25, and plug in, n is 25, plug in 25 for n, and I get 4 equals k over the square root of 25. I can write this as 4 over 1 equals k over 5, and these inversely problems I like to solve by cross multiplying. I do that by making the left side a fraction. Notice I square rooted the 25, and now I'm going to cross multiply. I multiply up, I get 1 times k. Multiply down, I get 4 times 5. That's the end of step 2. I have now k equal to 20, and none of this will go in my answer. I'll move on to the last sentence. That's kind of step 3. And I'm going to answer the question that needs to be answered. It says find m, so I'm going to leave m alone when n is 16. Into the right side of the equation, I'm going to plug 20 in for k in the numerator of that fraction I created in step 1. And in the denominator of the fraction that I created in step 1, I'm going to plug a 16 in for n, because I was given 16 in the third sentence. And I'll simplify this. And my answer is just going to be the number 5. Do the same thing for 2, but maybe get a little bit lazier. First sentence allows me to get an equation with a K. Inversely was the only one of the three variations that involved division. The other two involved multiplication. If I see directly or jointly, the equation I create is going to have multiplication jointly um, after the k in my multiplication on the right-hand side, I get two variables. So immediately, as I read through problem two, the first variable I see is the variable y, or the letter y. So I'm going to write y equals, because I don't see the word inversely, I don't get a fraction. The next letter I'm going to write is a k. Because I see the word jointly, after the k, I'm going to need to get two letters or two variables being multiplied with the appropriate exponent or radical symbol. The first letter that's going to go after my k is the variable that represents the cube of x. Because that doesn't have the word root, I'm just going to get an exponent. And then the second variable that's going to go after my k represents the square of z. 
And again, because I don't see the word root, the square gives me an exponent of 2. That's the end of the first sentence, done with my first step. Move on to my second sentence, take the numbers from the second sentence, plug them into my equation, and solve for k. First number I get is y equal to 144, plug it in for y, equals, and on the right hand side I'm solving for k, so I'm just going to leave the k there. Um, y equals 144 when x equals to 2, so plug a 2 in for my x, and z equals to 3, plug a 3 in for my z, and do the algebra to solve for k. Specifically on the right hand side, I'll do the exponents of 2 cubed, which is 8, 3 squared, which is 9. This will allow me to write the problem as 144 equals 72k. Then I'll divide both sides by 72 and get 2 equal to k. Done with the second sentence, I'll move on to the third sentence. Third sentence tells me to find y. I'm going to write y equals, and then all the variables on the right-hand side, I'm going to change to numbers that fit what they need to fit. The k I'm going to plug in 2, and then from the third sentence, I'm going to plug in 3 for x and 2 for z. And this is going to lead me to my answer. Definitely calculator worthy. So let me do 2 times 3 cubed times 2 squared. And my answer should be 162, assuming I haven't made any wretched errors. And on my little sheet of paper here, I have a different answer. Oh, I don't have this done right. This should be 2 times 3. Uh, 2 times 27 times 4. Forget it. 3 cubed is 27. 2 squared is 4 should get 216. Sorry, I'm having some calculator issues. I don't want to fight through them. My answer, if this was a test, the only thing I'd have to write on my answer blank is y equals to 216. The next two problems are still more problems from the last section in the chapter. They're the bigger word problems that I need to kind of, you know, make my three steps as, as carefully taken as I can. As I read through number three, it says the demand D for candy in a movie theater is inversely related to the square root of the price P. So what I've boxed up is going to help me get my equation that I need to set up on step one. In step one, I'm trying to find D is inversely related to the square root of P. All the other words in there just kind of add flavor, maybe make, make more meaning out of the problem, but these are the key words. What I boxed up is what I need for my equation. D is going to stay a D. The is that I wrote is going to be the, an equal sign. Because I see the word inversely, I know I need in my equation a fraction with a K in the numerator. And in the denominator is symbols to represent the square root of P. That's just simply P under a square root symbol. Done with the first sentence, now I'm into the plugging numbers in. Second sentence, it says when the price of candy is $4 per bag, so I'm going to plug in 4 for the P, and I'm going to skip the decimals. I don't need the two zeros. They're irrelevant in terms of doing algebra. So when the price of candy is $4 per bag, the theater sells 150 bags of candy. I plug the 4 in for the price. The D is the how much candy they're selling, and in this case, it's 150 bags. Let me solve this. I'll go this way because I'm getting towards the bottom of my paper here. I'm going to write the 150 as a fraction. I'm going to square root the 4, and I'm going to cross multiply up and get 1 times K. I'm going to cross multiply down and get 150 times 2. The end of step 2 gives me k equals to 300. So done with the first sentence, done with the second sentence. None of those steps wind up in my answer. The third sentence 
is where I need to get my answer from. So I'm going to use the equation that I've created in step one, the value of k that I found in step two, and then the number that's given in this third sentence to answer my question. So determine the number of bags of candy that will be sold if the price is raised to $9 per bag. So I'm going to put a 9 in for the p without the decimal. And I'll just do the algebra. d is going to be 300 over 3, because square root of 9 is 3, and that's 100. If I want to write a lazy answer, I might just say 100 bags or 100 bags of candy will be sold when the price is, you can spell, let me just say 100 bags of candy for my answer. If you just wrote 100 bags, I can live with it. If you said 100, can, 100 bags of candy will be sold when the price is $9 per bag, that would be the optimal answer. One more problem from the word problem section, and then everything else is kind of intercepts, lines, symmetry, and circles. So if I went through problem four and looked for the keywords in the first sentence, it says the distance D it takes a car to stop is directly proportional to the square of the speed it is moving. What I just box up is really what I need. I need that D is directly proportional to the square of S. That's D the distance, the, car, the distance it takes a car to stop is directly proportional to the square of the speed. So let me create my equation. My step one, I'm going to write a D equals for the D is directly proportional. Because it's directly and not inversely, I get a multiplication with just one variable after the K. So after my equal sign, I write a K. I don't write a fraction. I only write a fraction if it says inversely. And after the K, I get something for the square of S. That's just going to be S with an exponent of 2. Second step, move on to the second sentence. A car traveling 10 miles per hour, the 10 is going to go in for the speed, can stop in 15 feet. The 15 is going to go in for a D. This is going to now be the equation I need to solve for K. And I'm going to write my K as a decimal because it just makes it easier for me to press buttons. And it kind of doesn't matter if you use k as a decimal or a fraction when the decimal terminates. So I think that's a better way to go for this. If on my calculator I did 15 divided by 100, I'd get the 0.15 for k. Done with the second sentence, moving on to the last sentence. In the last sentence, I'm going to figure out how far it takes the car to stop if it's traveling 40 miles per hour. I'm going to use the equation that I created. I'm going to plug in 0 0.015 for k because that's what I figured in step two. And I want to find the distance it takes to stop when a car is traveling 40 miles per hour. So I'll put 40 in for the speed. And I'll just do this on my calculator. 0 0.15 times 40 squared. It'll take 240 feet to, top, to stop. So I get d equals 240. And this represents the 240 feet that it will take to stop when it's traveling 40 miles per hour. Uh, that's kind of far. I don't know what my car can do, but um, I just made these numbers up. They might not have anything to do with reality. All right, now we're into just the traditional algebra. No more real word problems. The only word problems came in the last section. Five and six want me to find x and y intercepts. You have to do them separately. To find x intercepts, you let y be 0. So in problem 5, if I wanted to find the x-intercept, I'd go 2x minus 8 times 0 equals 32. This piece turns into 0, so this would simplify to 2x equals to 32. And then when I divide by 2, I get x equal to 16. Part of my answer to number 5 
needs to have the x-intercept written as a point. The x value is 16, the y value is 0. And then I'll do the y-intercept separately. To do the y-intercept, you let x be 0. This piece with the 2 times 0, 0 is out. I'll divide by negative 8 and get y equal to negative 4. And the rest of my answer, the y-intercept, will be the point 0, negative 4. 9 is a little bit harder because of the exponent. For one of the intercepts, I'm going to need factoring. For 9, to find the x-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 for y and go 0 equals x squared plus 4x minus 12. I'm assuming you all can factor this. If you can't factor this, watch the second part of my video for, from Intermediate Algebra for section 1.3. So section 1.3 part 2 in my Intermediate Algebra videos will teach you that this will factor into x plus 6 times x minus 2. Eventually, you just have to know how to factor without me explaining how to factor every single time. It just takes too long, and most students by now could factor something this basic. Because I have it set equal to 0 and factored, to get the numerical answers, I need to take each of the factors and separate them and set each one separately equal to 0. and do the algebra to isolate the x. All intercepts should be written as points. All x-intercepts have a 0 for the y. Half of my work is done. That's the hard part. For my y-intercept, I'm just going to plug in 0 for x. And when I do that, I get a couple zeros, minus 12, and the y-intercept will wind up having a minus 12 for the y part, but intercepts always need to be written as a point, and I always say the opposite letter is 0. For a y-intercept, the opposite letter would be x, the x will be 0. For an x-intercept, the opposite letter will be y, the y will be 0. 7, 8, and 9 are the three symmetry questions that come up on the test. I don't, I don't give you an equation and ask you to find the symmetry. I just give you some graphs and ask you to complete the graph to make it have the indicated symmetry. In problem 7, I'm supposed to complete the graph and make the new graph, the whole graph, symmetric to the x-axis and label each new point. So how do I find the points? If I want to create a graph that is symmetric to the x-axis, I change the y-coordinate of the point. The first point is y is 0. I can't really change it because 0 changing its sign, it's, it's signless in some sense. The first point's not going to change. But the second point will. The second point now is going to become the point 0, 2 on my extension of this graph. The third point, 5, negative 3 is going to turn to point 5, positive 3. I'm changing the signs of the y. I'm leaving the signs of the x's. It really should be negative 5, positive 3. I didn't, shouldn't have changed the sign of the x. The last point I marked, negative 12, negative 4, when I go to draw my graph that's symmetric to the x-axis to finish this graph so that the x-axis will cut it into equal halves, I just simply change the y. And now the best I can, which is not so good, I connect the points. And I try the best I can to make the top and the bottom half look the same. If you want something better, my computer can do much better. This is what your graph really should look like. That's what my graph looks like. And for me, that's not so bad, but it should be smoother. It shouldn't have these the humps in it that my graph has in it. This kind of is what it is. 
8 wants me to extend the graph to make the other half of the graph so it's symmetric to the y-axis. And to do this, I just change the x's. I can't change the first x of 0 because the 0 doesn't really have a sign I can deal with. But this second point, negative 2, positive 3, I can change it to positive 2, positive 3. And the point negative 3, negative 2, I could change it to positive 3, negative 2. Just changing the x and not changing the y. The last point I marked, negative 4, negative 9, can turn to 1, 2, 3, 4, positive 4, negative 9. Just change the sign of the x's and not the y's. And then draw the other half so that it's creating mirrored images on across the x-axis. And again, this is what it really should look like. I have the points all marked there really nicely, and it's drawn by you know my printer. Doesn't shouldn't have those wobbles in it like mine does, but it is what it is. You know, you do the best you can do. The last one of the symmetry problems gives me a segment of a graph and I want to complete it so it's symmetric to the origin. For this, I need to change both signs. I need to change the x's and the y's. So the point zero, 0, I'm not going to change that because 0 is kind of signless. But the point negative 1, negative 1, I'm going to change to positive 1, positive 1. The point negative 2, negative 8, I'm going to change to, can't even read this. Whoops, that's not 1. Ha ha ha, idiot. Let me do this in black. My increments here. So this is actually 5, 10, 15, 20. So 1 is up here somewhere. So my first point, 1, 1, was really um, poorly plotted based on my not being able to see the numbers on the axes so well. The point 2, 8, I'm going to estimate to be about here. I, the right 2 is not an issue, it's the 8. The 8 is under the 10, above the 5. And then the next point, 3 and 27, this is why the window got out of whack to get room for this point. So 3 and then 27 maybe is about there. Now I'm just going to connect these points best I can with kind of the same shape flipped over. Remember, to get a reflection about the origin, if you physically want to do it, you take the original graph, flip it up over the x-axis and then flip it over the y-axis. You'd flip it once in a second. The second flip is the, the, the completion of the symmetry. And again, if you wanted a nicer graph, this is exactly how those things would plot on the same graph. Tens no algebra. It gives me a point in the slope, and it just wants me to graph the line and label a point. Unfortunately, I didn't make myself any graph paper for this, which is going to make this whole deal harder than it should be. So I'm going to start off and plot the point that's given, which is the point 6, negative 2. Just trying to graph a line that passes through the point 6, negative 2, that has a slope of 2 thirds. Because the slope is 2 thirds, to get to another point on the graph, I'm going to start from the point that I've marked, and I'm going to go up 2. So I'm going to go up from negative 2 to negative 1 to 0. And then I'm going to go right 3. So from 6, 1 to the right is 7. 2 to the right is 8. 3 to the right is 9. I'm going to go to that point right there. I go up 1, up 2, right 1, 2, 3. And the coordinates of that point is 9, 0. If you do this on graph paper, it'll be super easy to tell what the coordinates of the points are. But if you're not, it's not particularly hard. And now I connect those with a line. 
and I usually put little arrows at the edges of my line signifying that this thing doesn't stop, that it keeps going. And that's all there is to do for that. 11 gives me two points and it wants me to find the slope of the line that connects the two points. Not particularly hard to do. To find the slope of a line that connects two points, I form a fraction. In the numerator, I subtract the y-coordinate of the second point minus the y-coordinate of the first point. In this case, that's 9 minus 5. In the denominator, I subtract the x-coordinate of the second point minus the x-coordinate of the third po first point. In this case, it's 5 minus negative 3. This is going to give me 4 over 8 because the denominator, the double negative, turns positive. And if I reduce that fraction, I get my answer that the slope of the line in number 11 is equal to 1 half. Number 12 talks about parallel and perpendicular lines. It's three parts. First part is to find the slope of the given line. Because this line is in y equals mx plus b form, the slope of the given line is the number in front of the x which is going to be negative 4 thirds. And then it asks two things, to find the slope of all lines that are parallel to the given line and find the slopes of all lines that are perpendicular to the, par the given line. Well, the slope of parallel lines have the same slope, so any line that has the same slope as my original problem will be parallel to the given line. So the answer to part B is going to be negative 4 thirds because parallel lines have the same slope. For part C, find the slope of all lines perpendicular to the given line. Perpendicular lines have slopes, slopes that are reciprocals with opposite signs. Because my initial slope was negative, my perpendicular slope is going to be positive. Because my initial slope was a fraction 4 thirds, my perpendicular slope is going to be the fraction 3 fourths. And that's all there is for that. For the next few problems, I ask you to find equations of lines. I always use y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 to get my equations. I showed in the video how to use the y equals mx plus b formula. If you're comfortable with that formula, you're more than welcome to do it. If you got the same answer for 13 and use a different method, you just pick the method that I don't care for. So for problem 13, I'm asked to find an equation of a line that has a slope of 6 and passes through the point 8, negative 4. What I'm going to do is, in for the slope, I'm going to plug 6 into the point-slope formula. In for the x, I'm in for the x1, I'm going to plug 8 into the point-slope formula. And in for the y1, I'm going to plug negative 4. I'm going to plug the three given numbers into the formula and get y minus negative 4 equals 6 times x minus 8. And then I'm going to do the algebra to solve for y, and that will be my answer. To the left of the equal sign, I'm going to make my double negative positive. To the right of the equal sign, I'm going to distribute and clear the parentheses by going 6 times x to get 6x, 6 times minus 8 to get minus 48. And then I'm going to minus 4 and minus 4. That's going to give me the answer, y equals 6x minus 52. <sighs> Let's just do one more, and we'll just have circles on the second part. of. Well, uh, I'll try to do. First, now, let's pause. Let me, it's 30 minutes already. Let me pause it and do a part two right here. So we'll have some lines and all of circles to do on the part two for this practice test.